few years ago, I started running. Or I should say, I started by huffing and puffing and swearing a lot. But eventually I worked my way up to running about 25 miles or 40 kilometers per week. Now, of course, my body was completely transformed. And around the time I reached my equilibrium weight, I traveled from Paris to Atlanta to visit family. Like all long-term expats, one of the first things I did when I arrived in America was go shopping. So I find myself trying on pants and asking for increasingly smaller sizes until finally the sales lady says to me, just admit it, you're tiny, drawing angry stares from women in other fitting rooms. So that night, I'm telling the story to my brother and a friend of ours, and they said to me, well, you are extra small. And I said to them, I may be an Atlanta extra small, but I'm a Paris medium. So, um, we had a laugh about that, but I began to reflect seriously on the truth of my statement and how my self-image differs in the two cities. In Atlanta, I wear bolder colors and shorter skirts and, in general, feel more alluring and confident than when I'm in Paris. And the ex explanation cannot be as simple as the average Atlantan being larger than the average Parisian. Instead, I think the answer lies in the very different cultural context in which I find myself in the two cities. I am a black American woman who advises executive level leaders. Now in Atlanta, often referred to as a black Mecca, none of these qualities is particularly remarkable. In Paris, by contrast, particularly in elite professional settings, I am other in numerous ways. I'm a foreigner, a racial minority, an underrepresented gender. In short, I am not mainstream. So it occurred to me that perhaps my decision to dress more conservatively in Paris relates to a desire to blend in or to avoid yet one more other label. So I began to wonder whether I am the only one who's uncomfortable with otherness. As you might guess, I'm not. <laughs> so I want to explain to you today how this resistance to difference affects aspects of our identities more fundamental than our fashion choices, in particular our work identities. But first, let me explain the stakes. So diversity is being hailed as one solution to dysfunctional decision-making in large business organizations. The argument goes that diversity will improve creative thinking and problem solving by introducing new perspectives and will, in the words of one brief to the US Supreme Court, contribute to a positive work environment by decreasing incidents of discrimination and stereotyping. And this quest for greater diversity has been broadly undertaken in corporate America. Uh, over 1,000 companies compete annually in uh, Diversity Inc.'s annual competition to name the top 50 companies for diversity. And these companies report having such diversity promoting initiatives as targeted recruiting and an emphasis on improving representation in leadership. Despite these initiatives, there are still boards that look like this. In fact, white men continue to occupy over 73% of the board seats of Fortune 500 companies. Now in the C-suite, the picture is even worse. 90% of Fortune 500 CEOs are white men. So these numbers are only part of the story. In addition, and perhaps more importantly, we need to be asking ourselves, are we changing our image of what a CEO should look like? So if you run a Google search for the phrase CEO photo, the top results look like this. Now, that last photo on the second row is particularly instructive as, as it is actually a stock photo available in a popular image bank under the title 
confident CEO. So, <laughs> uh, how do we move from a world where the C-suite, the boardroom, and even popular imagination are dominated by images of the white male leader? Well, let's return to the issues that I raised at the outset. So I've already let on that I am not the only one who is uncomfortable with otherness. In fact, a sociologist, Irving Goffman, wrote about a phenomenon called covering in his 1963 work, Stigma. And he noted that most people attempt to de-emphasize their difference from the mainstream, the so-called normal or mainstream. Uh, NYU law professor Kenji Yoshino has written extensively about covering in the context of equality law. He writes uh, in a uh, short piece in the uh, March 2014 Harvard Business Review, he published results of a survey of 3,000 employees of over 20 large US companies. And he and his co-author reported that 61% of these employees felt pressure to cover in the workplace. And of those employees who felt this pressure to downplay their differences, two-thirds indicated that it undermined their sense of self. Another particularly disturbing uh, uh, result from this survey was that 57% of employees indicated they would not stick up for their identity group. The example given was of an employee who said, even though I am of Chinese descent, I would never correct anyone who makes jokes or comments about Asian stereotypes. Now, remember, one of the objectives of diversity is that new perspectives are being introduced and that uh, stereotyping is decreasing. If there is this widespread lack of advocacy for one's identity group, then diverse perspectives are being muted and this benefit of diversity would seem to be thwarted. Now, in another passage from uh, this short piece, Yoshino reports about a uh, worker who said, uh, who said that she made a concerted effort to avoid being seen with other African-American professionals because she wanted to avoid the labels that she had seen placed on her peers. Now, as distasteful as that might sound to some of you, it was actually rather familiar to me. When I first joined the firm where I started my career, I was frequently asked to interview African-American candidates, and at one point, I refused. I protested that it was simplistic to focus on one aspect of my identity to match candidates uh, with poten potential interviewers. I now think, however, that part of my protest was that I did not want to be categorized as the black associate for fear of the stigma of being perceived as a diversity hire and therefore less qualified. So like me, you may need to engage in a serious self-assessment to determine are there aspects, where, are there uh, areas where you are covering? And if so, think about why. Have you internalized a negative stereotype? Or are you perhaps in an environment where you're being pressured to cover? Uh, like 61% of the workers in the survey that I mentioned. Now in the workplace, and in most places, this pressure to cover likely comes from managers' uh, stereotypical views about the ideal worker. And these stereotypes can be descriptive or prescriptive. Descriptive stereotypes relate to beliefs about how a group is. For example, working mothers are less committed to their work, or African Americans are untrustworthy. Prescriptive stereotypes, on the other hand, 
relate to beliefs about how a group should be. For example, women should be helpful and cheerful. East Asians should be meek. Unlike pressure to cover, which requires or which asks that an employee downplay certain of their differences from the mainstream, prescriptive stereotypes actually ask, uh, require that workers uh, demonstrate or exhibit qualities that are typically associated with, let's say, that are believed to be typically associated with their identity group. And again, studies show that violations of prescriptive stereotypes, the woman who is too ambitious, the East Asian who displays dominance, who gives orders, that violations of these stereotypes result in backlash in the workplace in the form of negative evaluations or um, discrimination in pay and promotions. I recall a woman, a senior woman at a professional services firm who had stellar performance reviews. Yet during her annual evaluation, this woman was told that if she wanted a promotion, she needed to be more of a cheerleader. So uh, she worked in an office where the men were far from collegial and in fact were frequently openly cutthroat. But she was being told that her success in the organization depended on her becoming a supportive and cheerful team player. Now, not long after this review, she left uh, that, uh, that organization and went and found a, a work environment that was more inclusive where women were actually allowed to display ambition without being punished. So if you find yourself in an environment uh, where you're feeling this particular pressure, uh, pressure to cover, uh, pressure to uh, uh, pressure from uh, stereoty uh, prescriptive stereotypes, like her, you may need to move on. And I know that is perhaps uh, sometimes uh, easier said than done. But hopefully you're seeing that with this pressure from prescriptive stereotypes on the one hand and from uh, obligations to cover on the other, Workers are walking this tightrope where they're not truly free to be themselves in the workplace. Can we really call this diversity? The promised positive environment and decreased stereotyping, this change in mindset is not happening. Now for those of you who may be thinking this talk is not all that relevant to me, let me just explain that white men are subject to both uh, pre uh, pressure to cover, uh, for example, issues related to age, uh, socioeconomic background, mental or physical disability, and white men are also subject to prescriptive stereotypes. Uh, for example, uh, men are not supposed to be emotional, so never show your sadness at work. Um, so we are all in this mess together. How do we get out of it? Well, I personally have a long history of covering and of uh, being told how I should be. The summer after my 11th birthday, my mother died quite suddenly and unexpectedly. So literally overnight, I went from a happy family, being a member of a happy family to being a motherless child. And like many children who lose a parent, I wanted nothing, I wanted to desperately to be nothing but normal. But should be's like mournful, angry, traumatized, hovered over me like birds just waiting to peck away at my identity. And probably for the next 10 or, f or 15 years, I was in this battle of uh, being normal or being how I supposedly should be. Finally, um, my uncovering began when I found the courage to advocate for uh, someone at my law firm, a non-mainstream candidate. Uh, this candidate was actually a South Asian male who I uh, thought would make a good associate, but whose grades at law school would likely have caused my law firm to overlook him. 
I chose to advocate for him because, like me, he was a striver, and he had gotten to Harvard Law School from a very modest background. So my firm listened to me. They hired this uh, guy, and the successful advocacy emboldened me to uncover other of my differences from the mainstream. So how do you develop your courage to uncover? Well, doing justice for others may be a good first step. Challenge stereotypes, even if they are not about your identity group. Um, you may also uh, want to privilege and seek out truly inclusive work environments. Now, I know that this is a two-way street and that the c it is up to companies to create these cultures of inclusiveness. So I do advise leaders that they need to engage in serious uh, self-assessment, that they need to identify and uh, have the courage to identify um, areas of bias and to work to remediate them. Now I cannot promise that if you all uh, heed my call to action that every CEO will look like Ursula Burns of Xerox <laughs> or that every chairman of the board will look like Melody Hobbs of DreamWorks. My hope instead is that faces like these begin to appear when you search Google, or more importantly, when you search your mind's eye for phrases like CEO or board director. Now, the journey toward authentic diversity involves each of us allowing others to be themselves and it, at the same time, having the courage to be ourselves. But this journey is not for the faint of heart. As E.E. E. Cummings, ending in poetry, wrote in A Poet's Advice to Students, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is trying night and day to make you somebody else is to fight the hardest battle any human being can fight and never stop fighting. Thank you.